From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. Frequent listeners of this podcast will know that we often try to feature guests who've overcome obstacles in their lives through determined resilience, grit, and an inspiring sense of optimism. We also profile people working on some of today's toughest challenges, driven by hope and purpose. As you'll soon discover, today's guest checks all of these boxes. Raul Espinoza is the executive director of All Kings, a nonprofit organization that creates diverse and intergenerational communities to support and empower men who've been impacted by the criminal justice system, as well as younger men at risk of being impacted. Raul comes to this work after 17 years of experience as an emotional intelligence and personal development consultant. He's worked to support oppressed communities around the world through a variety of projects, including social incubators within the favelas of Brazil, psychosocial development groups in Iraq, youth empowerment groups in India, and many more. Raul has experience with psychosocial development, neuro-linguistic programming, emotional intelligence development, leadership training, and mindset coaching. He's worked with local projects with the Department of Probation, Carnegie Hall, and Stop the Violence. And Raul has a remarkable personal story of his own. And we're pleased to bring it to you in this Blue Sky episode. Raul Espinoza, welcome to the Blue Sky podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure having you on. And I'd like to start with your own personal story because it's an interesting one. Your parents came over from Bolivia to the United States. You were born in Queens. Um, and you're described on the on your website as being familiar with the struggles of family violence, substance abuse, systemic racism. Your outlet was breakdancing in the arts. And then you attended Parsons University on a scholarship, which is a very competitive, great program. So if, if I stopped there in your bio, I don't know how it would necessarily lead me to the work you're doing today. So I'd love for you to just sort of reflect on that, your history, your education, and how you wound up doing the work you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, I was actually born in Texas. Oh, I thought you were born in Queens. No, I was raised in New York. My family, okay. well, my mom and my sisters and I moved to New York when I was 10 years old. Gotcha. And it was actually at a, as a result of what you previously mentioned before, as far as my family upbringing. Now, I grew up in in a house that had some domestic violence. Uh, there was abuse of maybe some alcohol. Um, it was it was a very confusing environment in a sense, uh, and that that's really where my arena first started with contribution and impact and and doing what I needed to do uh, in a sense. And I'll get more into that. But the way that I grew up, it was it was confusing in a sense because my father was a, a bit of my hero when I was a kid and a very loving, charming man, very funny, social. Uh, he was the guy that liked to put music on and dance with my mom in the kitchen. And simultaneously, he was, it was an environment where one morning I would wake up and why is there a hole in the wall? And where's dad? And why is mom locked in the room crying? And, and, and so these, it, it started escalating more and more as, as tension would continue to unfold. And at a certain point, it got to a point where every night there's just screams. Every night there's arguments right outside the, the, the room. My father's sleeping in my room. My sister was sleeping in my mom's room. Dad wasn't there because he was kicked out or because something, something happened and he left and then he would come back. So it was a very unpredictable setting. And what I had to deal with was, one, there didn't seem to be much capacity to hold me. There wasn't a lot of understanding about what was occurring for me, the impact on me. I just needed to kind of deal with it. So when I talk about my wounds, especially as I got into doing men's work, part of the wounds was, one, the experience of what happened, the, the events that, that occurred. And the second part of my wounds was that who I needed to be through them. And as a, as a man and the only boy of the family, I was in the, the need to man up 
and toughen up and boys don't cry. And I got conditioned with that type of mentality of resilience, regardless and despite what I was of what was occurring for me. And so for years, I kind of just piled on on top of anger, on top of sadness and frustration and not understanding quite what was happening in my environment. And, and then we come to New York with difficulties of money. You know, dad's not around. Mom's working two jobs, very angry and jaded. Bless her. You know, she, she did the best with what she what she had. Um, but it was a, a bit of a tough ringing and I was left to my own mindset and my own struggles mentally, emotionally. Uh, and even physically of what I was what, what I was enduring. And so that was kind of how the priming started of me feeling something needs to be done here. And and why why the arts? Why break dancing I could see sort of a physical release, expressive release and then going to Parsons. How did that all come about? Yeah, so my my father was my greatest mentor of what not to be. So my father was extremely talented. He was a, an amazing musician. He's a good singer. Um, unfortunately, I've seen him get in fights. He's a good fighter. Uh, he's, yeah, he's a good artist and a great soccer player and a coach. Like he had all these talents and he never really did anything with them. And, and, and so when I was growing up, I associated so much of his behavior to the uprooting of my reality. Like I lost my childhood home. I lost my family structure the way I had it because of his untethered shadow, unable to do his own reflection and work to really correct these behaviors in a way that's beneficial for the family. And so my father would would drink. And so at, at 10 years old, I made a decision of I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs. I'm, I'm going to respect women because my dad abused women. I'm going to make something of all my talents because my dad had all these talents and never did anything with them. So it was it was my outlet. And if I didn't have peers that I felt really understood me, I felt like a grown up around, around other kids because they weren't, I felt like they didn't come from the environment that I came from. So I felt a good bit isolated. And since I didn't have these outlets of alcohol or drugs or uh, at that time, sex or anything like that, that could really distract me. My only vehicle of expressing these emotions was the arts was dance, was mu- I'm a musician, I play a couple of instruments, I'm a dancer, uh, I'm an artist itself, I'm a photographer, filmmaker. I, I just dove deep into the arts because that was my form of sanctuary and expressing the things that I didn't have language for. Incredible, because when I hear your story, it could so easily have gone the other way and you could have so easily just perpetuated that cycle of abuse and trauma and alcoholism and all of it. So there's something special in you um, that took you down that path, and thank goodness it's there. So you you began doing personal development work in late 2000, 2008, coach, personal growth facilitator. What what drew you to that? How did you get into that kind of work? Obviously, you've done a lot of, quote unquote, work on yourself to have this understanding of your upbringing and, and how you've gotten to where you are today. But what got you to start working with others and trying to help others? When I first got into the work in 2008, I went for myself and it took a a friend of mine probably a year to enroll me. He was telling me about this, this program, this coaching program that's like mindset development, emotional intelligence, awareness, experiential learning. And I used to be like, I'm good. I don't, I don't need that, man. Like, look, I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking. I'm, I'm taking care of my family. At that point, my father had battled cancer twice. He's battled cancer four times in his life. In those times I've like left New York back to Texas to take care of him, despite my upbringing and what I went through, I was being who I thought I needed to be for my family. I was taking care of them to the best of my abilities, financially contributing to my father, trying to put myself through school. I was being respectful. I was making, I, I was at that point really diving into my artistry also. So I'm just like, I'm good. I really don't, I don't need anything, man. I'm fine. Yeah. And after a long time of him and and also my best friend who had done a similar program talking to me about it, it came to this notion that things don't necessarily need to be bad in order to be better. Mm. Uh, and there might be something of value that I could get out of this. And especially that I'm a growth oriented person. Why don't I try it out and lean in? Amazing. So to be honest, I went in arrogant and closed minded and saying like, all right, I'm going to show you guys how this program is BS. Right. And, and whatnot. Arms, arms folded. 
Yeah. And, but, but when I arrived to the arena, I'm not about to waste an opportunity. I'm going to rise up to, I'm going to cool. Let's see what's here for me. And so I leaned in and with what I discovered in that process, what there's these experiences and my relationship to trauma or my wounds and the way that has impacted me, I thought they were mine forever. I thought this is how the world works, right? This is what the world is. It is what it is. We just have to deal with it. Right. And I learned some basic tools on navigating through my story and learning how to put down some of that burden. And to me, it was it was revolutionary just because I've already been doing my own self-reflection for, for a couple of years at that point without real acquired instruments. Yeah. And I I had this kind of uproar of anger in a sense that came through because I, I felt this new sense of peace. Anger also came with it because... One of my other stories that I share is that I had a cousin that passed away from, he, he literally drank himself to death. He drank until his body shut down. And I understood that that was his medicine on trying to deal with what he was dealing with. Addiction uh, to, to any substance or any abuse of anything is like, it's, there's this internal conflict that we're trying to soothe and navigate and trying to get control of. And if I'm there, if I suspend it enough, I could find some level of peace. And that's the danger of addiction. And so I saw my cousin that passed away from it. I saw other friends and family. I saw the upbringing of my father's uninterrupted trauma responses and wounds of how he was operating from. And I was like, why aren't, why aren't we talking about this? Why, aren't, why don't more people know about these things? So I completed my training. Or I, was, I was going through my training probably the first week. And I made a vow that I want to be an interruption to as many people as possible. I want as many people to know about these tools, to know that they don't have to live with the burdens that they're living with. And fast forward 16 years, I've been doing this work around the world and now I'm you know, running this nonprofit here in New York, uh, doing that exact thing, planting that seed or op- allowing that to open up for new possibilities. Right off the bat, you get a sense here for Raul Espinosa's kindness and compassion. After my long recitation of his personal history, he calmly let me know that actually he was born in Texas, not Queens. Great start, Bill. Thankfully, Raul was able to get past my shoddy research to share his story. He describes his childhood confusion, where as on the one hand, his father was his hero in many ways, on the other, When he drank, he turned ugly and terrifying. But Raul's innate optimism is shown early on, and at the age of 10, he starts seeing his father as what he describes as a great mentor of what not to be. And he decides never to drink or engage in the abusive behavior he witnessed in his dad. To break out of these patterns and express himself more constructively and creatively, Raul turned to what he describes as a sanctuary the arts, and his life begins to follow a more positive trajectory, including beginning to work on getting men together to talk more about the challenges they all face. Next, I wanted Raul to describe how his newfound passions led him to work in places very far from Texas or Queens. So you mentioned around the world, five continents, Brazil, Iraq, I think you've done work, and now you're at All Kings. And a lot of our listeners might not have heard of All Kings. Can you describe what brought you to All Kings? And in in that description, just tell us what it's all about. Yeah, sure. So I'll I'll leave that for the later half. The the way that this worked is that I got picked up by a company. I went to to Spain. I lived in Spain in 2010 to coach for a transformational company out there, one of the first ones in Seville. And so I was out there for a number of months with a group of people, and we were launching this first coaching program about emotional intelligence, mindfulness, and doing this type of work. And I, I noticed the people there. Well, one, it's there's a saying of no matter where you go, there you are. And so there was wounds that I thought I was leaving behind here. And I was in a completely new environment, so new space, new me. And then over time my demons and my shadows and my struggle just caught up with me over there. And I looked at my environment over there in Spain. I'm like, oh, people are over here dealing with a lot of the same things too. And so I I, I started getting fascinated by how people relate to their reality. 
and especially that I come, like I consider my mom the underdog and myself the underdog. You know, we were up against the odds and the grain and we pushed through with goodness still in, in, in our intention. And so I got bit by the travel bug and just, it was my first time growing up with scarcity of money and resources and never thought that I could be around the world. And I thought that that was available for me. And so when I, I made this commitment to go to a new country and when I would go to that new country, I would look out for who's helping here, who's helping the bottom line here, who's helping the underserved or the oppressed communities here. And it became just a, a pattern of my travels that every country I would go to, I would work with local initiatives, grassroots initiatives that meant well was supporting some of the most oppressed people there. So I was living in the favelas of Brazil. I went to Iraq. I was I was in India for months and Senegal. And I mean, I've been to around 50 countries, almost every single one of them helping out local initiatives. And so that was that was my my focus. So when I came back to New York, I came across All Kings. I, I wasn't the founder. It, it started when I was, I guess, when I was uh, about five months before I joined. And so when when I connected with them, there was something in me that told me to be here. And it was around my own reframing and understanding around masculinity, my understanding about my version of oppression, uh, because I've always diluted my version to understand the more extreme parts of you know what people were dealing with. So it was a it was a healing place for me, let alone a new arena where I could go and serve the communities here that have been underserved and oppressed, and and, and also just understanding how I related to that as well. We didn't have money, we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the activities to really keep me safe, and so so many of my brothers and sisters have fallen to that addiction or maybe drug lifestyle or gang violence because that's where they felt safe. It's really interesting what you said in Spain. I'll just interrupt you for a second. Sometimes I've, I've heard it said that if you really want to learn a subject, teach it. And I wonder if when you were in Spain, you're, you're sort of teaching some of these life lessons and then it led to this learning about yourself. Is that fair? Yeah, it was. It goes back and forth. It goes from me learning to my, about myself. Um, there's this saying that I love that it says, uh, knowledge is just theory until it's felt in the bones. <laughs> and yeah. this knowledge and information is just this nice idea yeah. until I actually embody it and practice <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. And when I've learned to do that for myself and cause my own liberation through these instruments, and through these peers and support, I could go and support other people navigating what's true for them. I'm not here to tell someone how to be a man or how to do this work or how you should live. It's all about discovering your inner truth and what you need to move through in order to liberate yourself from that. And yeah, so that that was such a big part of, of my work. So tell us about All Kings and why it's such a good fit for you. Yeah, so All Kings, we're a peer-led men's group and is dedicated towards mental health, processing trauma, and developing leadership. And we mainly work with men that have been impacted by the justice system. So formerly incarcerated men, uh, returning citizens, we work with alternatives to incarceration programs. So if someone gets involved with any legal matters, uh, they, instead of getting incarcerated or going to jail, they do these other programs to maybe have a life change or something new in, in behavior or how they're interacting with the world. And we also work with young men at risk. And these young men are more so living a lifestyle that can easily land them more in incarceration or death so much easier than a life of abundance and peace and prosperity because of the limitations and because of the culture of what we're raised around. Uh, and so we work with active gang members and street kids or just young, young men that are just in the environments trying to navigate their way. And the reason why we do that also is because I had a million examples of what not to be as a man, especially in my home. I didn't have that much of a compass or, or a reflection. How do I actually model being a good man in my world or a good human being in my world? And so with these limited uh, resources and ability to, to reflect on that, this is an arena where we could all do our own internal work to process, to put some of that stuff down and step into our sovereign or our king and then we could go and model that for the younger generations that don't have that model and be an interruption to what's going on in the streets. Amazing. And on your website and in, in the literature, you say, your organization says, America's experienced a, cr a crisis of manhood. Can you define that for us? When you say there's a crisis of manhood, what does that mean? Yeah. So there's this, 
we, one of our guys would say not every prison has walls and someone can be incarcerated and more mentally, emotionally, and spiritually free than us out here in the free world. Uh, and that, that also means that when I lay my head on my pillow at night, I'm left to my own spirals and my, my sabotage and my, my desires, my fears, my shame, whatever it is that I'm dealing with. And in society, I'm talking more so common day society. And this isn't, this isn't a boohoo, you know, men, men have had it bad, worse than anyone else. You know, I, th- I think there's, there's an appropriate attention that needs to be distributed to people that have been impacted. But for men's work, the reason why it stands out is because we're raised to be, we're raised to be successful. That's one of the ambitions that we're taught to aspire to, right? So when, when I've done a lot of work with coaching for, for women, um, it's been a lot of empowerment, uh, joy, peace, just feeling embodied and feeling present and cu- cultivating the reality that I want to live. And when I work with men, it was all about success and what you could create and the value that you, we put on our production of what we create what we manifest or what we're able to sustain. And so that in that arena, women across and just in general society are allowed to be in their emotions, right? right? If they're, if they're except for angry. So they're allowed to be in their emotions, <laughs> except for angry, because if they're joyful, it's socially accepted. If they're sad, it's socially accepted. Ashamed or fearful is socially accepted. We've seen it in cartoons. We see it in movies. It's just part of something in societal norm. But if she's angry, she's problematic. She's dramatic. She's she's a conflict. You know, she's being in her angry embodied self. But overall, we in society we accept that women are more connected to their emotions. For men, we are allowed to be angry, and the other feelings is something that seems to be reflected as lesser than. So if I'm afraid, if I'm if I'm if I'm ashamed, or if I'm, even if I'm joyful, some people are like, what are you so happy about? You know, what do you, what do you, yeah, why, why are you so happy? And it seems like childish in a sense. But the only thing that we're encouraged to be is successful, which means to be powerful, which means to be aggressive, which means to be angry. That is our main overused instrument. So when I'm afraid, when I'm ashamed, anger is my tool that I utilize. And we wonder why men are the perpetuator of violence in our communities. That's been the the most uh, the instrument we've been most encouraged to use, and we've been we've been uh, taught to be away from our other emotions as if it makes us lesser of a man. So you have a lot of men that are just going around just unaware of their emotional intelligence and unaware about the wounds, the pylons, and how they're responding, how they're reacting from these places, and we're causing even more trauma out there. So that's a bit of a general kind of crisis that masculinity, especially if you come with different cultures, ethnicities, and if you come from the different parts of the system where you have even more obstacles in front of you, we're, we're taught to be something that might not be constructive to the reality that we're really looking to cultivate. It's interesting to hear Raul describe world travel as making it clear to him that so many of the problems he experienced in his own childhood are present everywhere. And what a great approach he took. He says that whenever he arrived in a new place, he would look to find who's helping. And I hadn't heard, but really liked the idea that knowledge is just theory until it's felt in the bones. And it's clear that Raul feels in his bones the challenges faced by so many men and that this knowledge is what ultimately led him to all kings. He says that in his work there, he's trying to address what he describes as a crisis of manhood in America. And as he does, you can hear in his voice that he takes on the realities of this challenging work with a calm and reassuring sense of optimism. Speaking of realities in the world in which you're working, a lot of people listening might be somewhat aware, but don't really think much about Um, the rate of incarceration in this country, particularly how it compares to other countries. But, you know, our prisons are overcrowded. They're packed. It's, I think there's, you had a statistic that nine out of 10 convictions in this country are men or two men. Can you talk about that and and how, how that 
impacts your work and how it motivates you to work with folks who are either on their, sounds like on a path to incarceration and you try to step in. And then those, and then another tragedy I think of our society is that once you're out of prison, we've made it very hard to get back into uh, sustainable life because you don't have the funds, you don't have the resources. And before you know it, you're back on the street, you can't get a job. So could you just, that's a big, that's a big question, but could you talk about incarceration in America and how it impacts your work? Yeah, sure. So America has over four times the percentage amount of the population going to prison compared to any other country in the world, four times. And so, and it's, there's, there's things to unpack here and we'll see what, which direction that we, we dive into. Um, but it's predominantly people of color. It's predominantly black and brown people that are, are incarcerated. Yet if you look at statistics of the states, this is a couple of years ago now, but it's about 15% of the states is, is African-American. About 13% is Latino. So in, in conjunction is about, let's say, 28% of the U.S. is black and brown with, with Latino and, and um, black men. Yet we make up 75% of the carceral system. There's a huge disproportion in numbers of uh, communities that are necessarily targeted. Not necessarily, that it's, it's partially the systematic oppression of incarceration, but also redlining, how that's affected communities, how... Uh, public schools are funded by the community that it's it's enlisted in, and then you have you have lower income communities that are funding overcrowded, underpaid uh, teachers and, and schools and facilities, with the likelihood of education being tied to my success or my ease really being less readily available to me. And so, you know, we don't, when we talk to these young guys, we're not necessarily saying, get off the street, don't be part of the gang. It's, a, it's more so driving a deeper understanding of why do you live the way you live? Why do you move the way you move? Right? Because that is how, if, if you are doing what you need to do for money, right? That is how you're eating. If you have a hard time going to your school, because when you leave the project, you have to cross the next project that has the other gang and you can't really go to school safely. And so you join a crew or a gang that is reputable, that is that has that comes with consequence. So if you mess with me, you mess with my gang. So you have protection, you have community, you have love, you have reliability. The only people that have the nice things around you are the ones that are doing it uh, maybe illegally. And we see our mothers uh, that are like overworked, working two jobs, trying to sustain. Uh, a lot of these fathers have been taken away to incarceration or they just haven't been part of the family. So we've been... It's, it's a bit about even some of my story about like who f who's fathering me? Where did I learn to be held and protected? Where did I learn my lessons from? It's my environment. And so when you take these, these types of environments, you put them in that pressure cooker, and then you, we have this stigma of how we're viewing our communities and how we like, all right, well, Harlem is dangerous. The Bronx is dangerous. Certain areas in Brooklyn are dangerous. Like, why is that? Well, because there's a higher rate of these activities. Why are those activities happening? That doesn't matter. Let's just let's just prosecute them. Let's just go and take back control. Well, clearly we see in history that it's not working. That doesn't work in, in that sense. And, and especially there's this going in, the kind of a rites of passage to going in prison where we're getting where where men get stripped, men and women get stripped of their identity and get placed a number and then a time frame on how they're how long they're incarcerated. And then when they return back, there's there's a 75% chance of recidivism of that they're going to go back to prison. Why is that? Because the infrastructure in which they are also returning to is not decoding or deconstructing the the time being institutionalized and and the wounds that happen from within, let alone what happened that even led them there in the first place. It came from somewhere, not to excuse anyone's behavior or not to excuse anyone's actions, but that came from somewhere. And as long as that's not treated, the root of how we survive and how we move through the world or even what we teach is still rooted in some of that trauma. So let's talk about, we have a sense for the problems you're trying to address and the, the people you're trying to help. Let's talk about your methods because it, I find it very interesting to read about and I'd love to learn more about it. So you, it's described on your website that your work is holistic, relational, and peer-led, which is, I think, particularly interesting. So can you talk about how you do your work at All Kings? We have different forms of, of our curriculum of how we implement it. The first form is called the Quest Weekend, where we do these retreats. 
And these, these retreats, we revisit our stories because our stories and our narrative have emotions connected to them that we might be unfamiliar with, right? And based on my story and my experience that I've had in my life, it curates and it dictates the filters that I look through and how I perceive the world and how I think I need to operate in them. Some of those are working and some of those are not working for me, right? And so it's a safe place to go and unpack and talk about our story. It's, it's a combination of sharing to somatic healing, experiential learning. We tie in a bunch of different things into the weekend. So that way we have a vehicle to consistently excavate what's going on down there. Where does this come from? And what are the origins of some of these beliefs? So that we could unlock whatever grip it has on us and provide a space for something new. And the peer-led part is, is essential because, especially for the men that are returning citizens, the, the medical field or the, the support as far as mental or medical help is tailored to medication, medical procedures, and a therapist. And the therapists oftentimes that are pretty much free-based because they, 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 there's no money to really go. And it's kind of like a more so maybe a nonprofit model. They're overworked and they have a load of, of different cases. But the thing about a therapy that it requires me to, to know what I have to say is it's how are you feeling? I don't know what I'm feeling. I've spent a lifetime trying to bury what I'm feeling. So I don't know what to share with you. And the magic about being peer led is that we all sit in a big circle. It could be 40 to 50 guys sitting in a circle, all telling our truth. And the way that I describe it is that my understanding of trauma is that there's this abrupt experience that my mind can't comprehend that goes beyond what I could understand, but it gets stored in the body. So for example, myself, I, I knew what a beating was before I knew what the word was. I knew what alcohol smelled like before I understood what alcohol was, right? And these are experiences that my body's understanding, but my mind doesn't comprehend. So then when I sit in a group of men that are all processing their version of their truth, someone across from me is going to say the thing that I didn't know how to say about myself. They mention something or they process something that like, oh, I resonate with that experience, yet I didn't have the language for it or even knew it was even there until you said it. So we all start unlocking each other and mirroring each other. And, and another real important thing about being peer-led is that it creates the arena for me to exemplify my leadership. We have a model that says, take space, make space. That means when I'm in it, I'm going to take up space. I'm going to share my truth. I'm going to be held by my brothers. And then when I'm complete, I take a step back and I make space for the next man to do the, the same thing. So what we're doing is also teaching and encouraging men to be safe containers for each other, not just in our arena, but out in the streets and how they relate to their families, how they relate to the children. How do I provide safety and truth within my circle? And the, I, we believe that the more men that are able to do that, especially in these neighborhoods that might, that might have a, a, a lack of that type of leadership with that intentionality, then the safer that our streets can become and the safer that we can become within them. The statistics that Raul Espinosa shares about criminal justice and incarceration in America are striking, and taking on the challenges these present has to be daunting. But Raul focuses on looking upstream, not just how we deal with men already in trouble with the law, but trying to get at the roots of criminal behavior and breaking generational cycles, as he himself has done. And instead of leaning only on professionals who are already overburdened, All Kings chooses a peer learning approach, and it's clearly powerful and effective. I imagine in this storytelling, a lot of these guys have not thought about or told their own story before. Never really been asked, right? Maybe never really thought, right? thought about it. So I imagine this is like you're cracking people wide open. I imagine it's emotional. Can you describe what that's like when you go around that circle? And, and, and am I accurate in my assessment? I think they think about their, I think a lot of men have thought about their story, but it's rooted in beliefs that, again, might not serve us. So, for example, I was six years old, seven years old. Uh, there was, there was a conflict that, that happened with my mom, my dad, my dad hit my mom. She defended herself. 
she screams, my family runs out, my sisters are behind my dad. My, I, I'm, I'm sorry, behind my mom. My dad's on this side. I saw my dad get taken away in cuffs at night for, for hitting her. And I was just left to just deal with my, with what was going on. And I don't recall anyone ever checking in on me. I was like, hey, how are you? How are you feeling? What, what happened for you? My family loved me and they cared for me, but they didn't really know how to ask me to, to navigate what's going on for you. And so when I was a very young age, I used to, at that time, pray. And I used to ask, help me help them. Give me the strength, the resilience, the courage, the, the understanding so that I could help them. I'm fine. I don't need anything. I'm good. Where did I learn that? Where did I learn to say, I'm fine. I don't need anything. For me, it was when I needed something, it wasn't there. So I had to learn to not count on anybody. So I grew up not trusting anybody. Because that's how I interpreted my reality. You can't trust someone. They're not going to be there. And when conflict arises, you're less important. You're less important than the problem. And so all these belief systems really dictated how I moved through my reality. So these men are reflecting on their story, but they might be concluding something in a disempowered context that's not serving their, their reality and how they move. They're walking out thinking, I must not be worthy of living. I must be what they, they think I am by incarcerating me. I, I, and, and all these belief systems that are go furthermore that don't support them and actually their own, their own work. Amazing. So, so there's the storytelling and then you list uh, body story, community equality as sort of four pillars of your work. Mm -hmm. So you, we've talked about story. Can you talk about body, community, equality, and how that factors in? Yeah. The body is a bit of, it goes, it goes with the I and the we. So, and what I mean by that is like, my experience, my journey. And when we come, I, when I, when we come into these circles, I say, I, I'm here for me and I'm here for you. And so that takes space, makes space models. Like, let me do some of my work. And in fact, that's how we create a safe container is I'm not going to ask you to go anywhere. I'm not willing to go. So here's the prompt. Here's the story we're going to talk about. I'll model first. Let me go do my work. So you could see another man, in his vulnerability, in his authenticity and truth, navigating and processing what's going on and being held safely by someone else. Let me go and embody that. So it's a bit about the individual journey. And to even to your previous question, we have young guys that after facilitating them, they're like, why do you care? Like, I don't get it. Why do you care? And to me, you're just telling me that you were never cared for that way. You're telling me that no one ever held space or watched your back or tried to interrupt you the way that is being, is being done so now. That your freedom uh, mentally, emotionally, physically is as important as anything else. And, and another portion of it, uh, we tie in somatic healing to this because a lot of it gets stored in here. A lot of it gets stored in in our back, in our bodies. It, it causes illnesses and and so we have different ways of relating on releasing things, whether it's emotionally or drawing understanding. So one of the ways that we do that is tell me a story about your upbringing as something that you feel maybe may dictated how you show up today. And it could be this event. And so what we start to do is like, where do you feel that? Oh, I've, I feel that in my shoulders. I feel tension in my shoulders and my neck. So we start to bring awareness, familiarity of our body and what it's telling us because our emotions are indicators. They, they're, they're our allies, right? We, and we, as men, we thought that emotions were a bit of the enemy, things that we're not supposed to feel. But shame is my internal compass telling me, you know you're better than this, right? Sadness is telling me, hey, there's something that you value and is not here right now. Right. These these are very essential tools that if I'm in relationship with my emotion, I could start to hone in. Where is my integrity? What is really important for me? And what do I really want from this situation? The longer I'm detached from my emotions and understanding, the more I'm left in the mind of how I think I'm supposed to operate out here. So the body work is us allowing ourselves to drop into our emotional intelligence and understand and release energy that that may be not serving us and cultivate the energy that would serve us. So you, you've described a weekend retreat. What else? So the, the individuals on that retreat, do they stay with your program in different ways once they're they've done that part? How does it how does that work? And and then also, I'd love to talk to you just sort of about the outcomes that you've seen from your work and what what keeps you going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they the men relate to the community in different ways. But the way that our structure is entailed is the first part is a quest retreat weekend. 
that's where I come from myself. That's where I take a deep dive in in uh, excavating my reality, my stories, my beliefs to a certain degree, right? Because we're only there for one weekend, right? So let's say I'm I'm 38 today, right? So if if I'm 38, I have 38 years of practice being who I know to be. This one weekend might have been powerful, but now what? I have to go back to my my block. I have to go back to my neighborhood. I have to go back to my relationships, however healthy or unhealthy they are. So the second pillar of what we integrate is the is our integration circles, our weekly circles. So now that I unpack this, we meet weekly with the men that I just went through the journey with to start practicing practical tools, active listening, conflict resolution, goal setting, integrity, accountability, clearings, blessings. Like when we say blessings, that's like honoring um, and gratitude uh, for what we see within each other and within ourselves. And so we start practicing these, these tools to start implementing them in our li- daily lived life, right? So that's the first one is for, for me, and it causes a bond, but it's for me. The second pillar is about us, us working and supporting each other and accountability to integrating this work. And then the third pillar is our leadership development, is now that I'm applying these tools, now that it's working for me and it's supporting me cultivate the reality that I want, keeping me safe and feeling me more empowered, I want to make space for the next man to go through. So our third pillar is about the we, about how do we develop the leadership so that not just inside of all kings, we have more facilitators that are that are powerful that could hold leadership, but there's more leaders out in the community that could be violence interrupters and know how to cause and create safe containers in the environments where there aren't any. Because we're 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 many men's safe haven. We're the only safe place that they can go to with their truth. And so what we want to cause is more spaces and more safe containers where people can arrive to to do their work. And how do these men find you? Are they referred to you, especially the ones who might be about to potentially be incarcerated or in this system, how, how do how do men get to you? Yeah, so I've developed a lot of partners with uh, reentry organizations. Okay, so men that are coming back and that are looking for to support their hierarchy of needs of housing, job placement, um, medication, whatever. There's these huge platforms that are supporting uh, men and women coming back from the system, and there's also tied in with alternatives to incarceration. So the programs that are they have different programming to support uh, rehabilitation or or change like uh, change in, in that sense. The thing is that this level of depth in mental health is not is not this is still an alternative to mental health and awareness, right? It's not uh, it, it it's not common the level of depth that we do our work to. So rather than us do our own thing, we want to support the infrastructure of New York of what's already going on. Who's there yeah. working with the youth already? Right. Who's there being violence interrupters? Who's there working in reentry? How do we support their staff and their participants to have the tools to support, not ensure because every every person does their own work, but increases the likelihood of success for them coming home or them integrating these tools that could better themselves. The All Kings approach is clearly very thoughtful and we can imagine the power in those circles as men take space and make space while telling their personal stories. But Raul is realistic and he understands that, as he says, one weekend can't undo 38 years. So weekly follow-ups are scheduled, leadership development follows, and ambitious and self-perpetuating goals are established, all through a peer-led team approach. And now, back to the final segment of our Blue Sky conversation with Raul Espinosa. Now let's talk about success. What what have you seen in terms of outcomes from your work and how are you feeling about how it's going? And and in the spirit of of this podcast, what is it about this work that keeps you optimistic, that keeps you hopeful as you do it? Because it's gotta be challenging and there must be days when you think, man, this is a this is a pretty heavy lift. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna touch on the optimism in a second. The the things I mean, some of the things that are really great here is that we could go to, you know, at-risk basketball tournaments or high schools, and we have a group of amazing men that have just hearts of gold that have either been through the system or not that are coming together in their brotherhood and harmony that are holding space and modifying, like uh, 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 modeling their leadership. And one of our guys said, um, 
uh, I want to be mindful not to curse because he said he <laughs> said it in a curse. But he was he was in our leadership weekend. This is a man that did I think twenty years uh, served time in prison, and like I said, we all were all modeling our leadership. So he was guiding a new a new man that hadn't been incarcerated, uh, and he was guiding him through the weekend and being kind of a, not a mentor but like a guide for the weekend. And at the end of the weekend, we just love on each other and express our gratitude for for who they are. And so my guy just drops into silence and he he's usually very charismatic and he was kind of quiet. I'm like, what's going on? Man? And he said that the person he was guiding me, he said, he called me a good leader. I've been told I was an F up all my life. I never thought anyone would call me a good leader. And you could just see that shift in him of like, oh, this is who I can't, this is what I represent. And now I have the power and ability to cause more of this out into the world. That, that I didn't have, you know, we have a saying that what we want most, we give best. And so you have a a group of men that just didn't have what they needed that now are empowered to be that for their community. The same community they might've taken from before, they now are there and being a change for the for the youth and the younger generations. And that's just one story of the many men. Like we've had over 350 guys go through our program. A lot of guys that work themselves in the leadership of different forms and that even work in different platforms. Uh, so that trend, that internal transformation of the significance and how I return and give back to my world is is one of our you know just great stories that that we've we've had. Is it that that keeps you going? That see you know. I think sometimes in work like yours, I imagine just just one story like that once a week, once a month, just something. Because I'm sure not everybody comes through it as, as as well as you hope. I'm sure you have some more successes. Sometimes it doesn't quite work out. But what is it that that keeps you getting out of bed and doing this tough work? There's a there's a couple of things. I don't know how I don't know how I ended up here. Because to your point the odds were against me to not be this man. Like I was so angry and in so much pain through so much of my life that went unheard. And there's so many people, there's so many, especially men that are not, that don't often speak about these emotions, dealing with a life of turmoil. And they fall to addiction and they fall to like resorting in violence or resorting into these these dances with shadow. And so when I think about my cousin, passed away who didn't have these instruments and work it's like we've had some young guys say that they're not carrying their gun anymore because of working because they're they're exemplifying and modeling their leadership here so we can't quantify that the kid in two weeks that was gonna die didn't die because we're doing this work right you know you know and so this this is causing not even just my own internal peace to live my life and not just survive it we're also causing the reality that more people are safe out there and surviving it Absolutely. and not fall into addiction, but fall into this different form of lifestyle. And you could never, you could never calculate the ripple effects on all that too, right? So he's not carrying the gun. Now he's serving as a role model for people in his community. They're thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't carry a gun. You could never quantify that. So just incredible. And, you know, I think in, in coming out of tragedy, there you know, if someone is in touch with themselves as you are, you come out of it with a different level of empathy, caring, concern, and you are exemplifying it in ways that are just off the charts. So if people want to support All Kings, are are you, do you take donations? Do you, you know, how can people listening to this inspired by your message, you know, learn more? I know how they can learn more about All Kings. I'll I'll take them to the website uh, in the show notes, but how else could they be of service to what you're doing? Yeah, I, I usually list it out in three ways, right? So one of them is yeah, visiting us at allkings.org. Uh, we're a 501c3, so we could take donations in that sense. We're a small team. Um, like As of now, we're looking to onboard another full-time person. As of now, I'm the only full-time person, and I have three part-times, one of them that just focuses on grants. And we're able to win, and I have a lot of leadership that we try to stipend and compensate because volunteering is at the luxury that I have my met, my needs met. 
And a lot of these guys that are working on do not have their needs met. And so we want to support their journey by compensating them for the efforts that they take in their leadership and, and spend time there. So one is financial needs as far as like any contributions goes towards sponsoring men to, to come to our weekend cost free, uh, where we provide the materials, transportation, food for them to come into this arena and do some of this work that they never had available before. Right. That's how we, we get by because we're not for profit. The second one is, is resources. Because we're a small team, we don't have a lot of resources or access to resources to, to different forms, whether it's like space that we could do, uh, use our training in um, uh, or, or organizations or platforms that work pro bono or have other type of means of support to, to, to support a grassroots organization. Um, so those are the first two. And the third one is if you are male identifying to come sit with us. No, this is not exclusively for men impacted by the system and adverse young men. They are the primary seats of why we exist. But like I said, not every prison has walls. And if, if, you know, if you're a human being, period, listening to this, you are dealing with your internal navigating on what to do and your own emotions and how they could cripple your, your joy or your peace. Right? And so for all male identifying participants, we open the, the floor to like come and do your work with us, see firsthand what we do and be part of the contribution to transforming these communities from the inside out in, in arms with us. Fantastic. And if anybody's questioning whether this is good use of funds, the expense of incarceration and all the other problems that come with what you're dealing with dwarf any amount of spending that is done to try to prevent these things in the first place. So um, please think about that as you as you consider who you, who you uh, like to support with your hard-earned dollars. So Raul Espinosa, you are an incredibly inspiring person. Um, it's amazing to hear you tell your story. I can only imagine the other stories that you hear and the work that you do. Um, and I just thank you for the work you're doing and for your time today. And I'm just really pleased to, to bring your message to, to our listeners of Blue Sky. Yeah, thank you so much for this space and even for doing this work. The optimism, possibilities, dreaming is the only way that we move forward with that that heartfelt love. So thank you for creating the arena where we could come and have this conversation. Thanks so much. There's so many inspiring moments described by Raul in our conversation. But for me, none more so than the man who's described by his mentee as a good leader after being told he was an F up his entire life. Raul's optimism comes through when he describes the desire to live life, not just survive it. And this drive is key to someone running a challenging, lean nonprofit with a full-time staff of one. And if you had to pick that one full-timer to do the work of all kings, you have to believe you couldn't choose any better than Raul Espinosa. I hope you enjoyed this Blue Sky conversation with Raul Espinosa. Before you go, we'd appreciate you leaving us a rating or review and hope you'll consider subscribing to our podcast to be sure you don't miss any future episodes. This and all Blue Sky episodes are made possible by the incredible editing and mixing done by Chad, Jessica, and the remarkable team at Sound On Studios. You can learn more about their work at soundonstudios.com. All graphic design and cover art for Blue Sky and the Optimism Institute are provided by Crush Graphics. And that's Crush with a K if you'd like to check out more of their fantastic work at crushgraphics.com. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke. And I thank you for listening.